So I've had a fairly unique idea for a shop air cleaner for a while now, and I found this blower on Craigslist that I thought would be perfect for what I was trying to do since the motor is separate from the blower fan. Now most of the shop air cleaners that you find out there filter the sawdust out of the air, which is great, but I wanted something that not only filtered the sawdust out of the air, but that could also be converted to an exhaust ventilation system that I could use with a paint booth or when working with anything that produces harmful fumes. Now this blower moved a ton of air and it would have been great if it weren't for one thing. That blower was so loud. So I went back to Craigslist and I found this old belt driven furnace blower which was much quieter but still moved a ton of air. I found lots of furnace blowers that had the motor inside the squirrel cage but what I really liked about this particular unit was that it was belt driven and the motor was separate from the fan itself. Now this was important because I was going to be potentially moving flammable fumes through the fan from my paint booth and I wanted to separate the motor from the fumes in order to help minimize any potential risk for explosion. Another thing that I really liked about this style blower was that it came with these L brackets that could be mounted anywhere around the outside of the fan which just makes it easier and gives you more flexible mounting options. The first thing I did was remove the motor bracket so that I could separate the motor from the blower housing. This just made it a little easier to get good measurements of the housing without the motor attached. Even when spinning by hand, the fan moves quite a bit of air. After I had all the measurements, I designed this box that encloses the blower and has the motor mounted outside of the box. The idea here is that when you're using it as a standard shop air cleaner, the furnace filters would slide in as well as this air diverter which slides into this little box that sits in the front. This little air diverter basically takes the air that the blower is throwing at it and it diverts the air out the side and then recirculates it around the room. When I want to paint or use it as more of an exhaust vent to extract air out of the shop and through the wall, I can simply pull out this diverter and replace it with one that funnels the air into this 8 inch duct and vents it through the wall to the outside. Now when I turn on x-ray mode, you can see how it funnels the air into this 8 inch duct. So the idea here is that when using it as an air filter, I would have some cheaper air filters on the outside that act as a pre-filter for the big dust particles and then more expensive high performance filters on the inside to pick up the really fine stuff. When using it as an exhaust ventilation system, the outside air filters would come out and then be replaced with plywood that has an 8 inch takeoff and makes it easy to add an 8 inch hose that I could then run to my paint booth or fume hood. I wasn't planning on using the original blue motor mounting bracket that came with the blower so to remove it, I had to remove both collars from each end of the motor that held the motor to the black mounting bracket. Then I was able to access the nuts that fastened the black bracket to the blue bracket. The plan is to use the black mounting bracket, which will still allow me to adjust the belt tension using the bolt on the end of the arm. Now since this is going to be more of a permanent fixture in my shop that hangs from the ceiling, I wanted it to look halfway decent. So I already had this 4 8 sheet of 3 quarter inch birch plywood that was already pre-finished with a UV cured finish and it looked really good so I decided to use that. To start, I broke down all the plywood into more manageable pieces using my circular saw. Then I took it over to the radial arm saw to cut down all the pieces. With my miter saw station set up, it's much easier and convenient for me to do most of my ripping on my radial arm saw. So I set up the saw for ripping and then ripped all of the larger pieces first. After everything was ripped, I set the saw back up for cross cutting and then I batched out all of the smaller pieces. The next step was to cut the angles for the inserts that go into the diverter box. The nice thing about designing this in SketchUp ahead of time is that I can see the exact angles that are needed for a perfect airtight fit. After I knew the exact angles, I used my digital angle gauge to set the angle of the blade and then made the cuts. <laughs> 
The first insert was fairly easy, but the second insert had more of an extreme angle that was a bit more challenging for my 8 inch blade. So I swapped out my 8 inch Woodworker 1 blade with a 10 inch blade, and that helped a little bit, but it still wasn't quite deep enough to make it through the entire cut. So I brought it over to the workbench and I used a handsaw to finish off the cut. The handsaw actually did a really nice job and it turned out nice and flush and I was really happy with it. I wanted to raise the blower up about three quarters of an inch from the floor so I found some scrap pieces and marked out the footprint of the blower housing and then cut these out on the saw. I needed to cut an opening for the front of the blower housing so that the air could make it into the smaller diverter box. So I marked it and then cut it out using my jigsaw. After I had everything cut out, it was ready to assemble. I chose to go with pocket screws since they're quick, easy, and it allows me to easily unscrew and disassemble it if I ever need to take it apart to make adjustments. If your cuts are clean and straight, you should be able to get a nice airtight seal even without glue or caulk. The front of the blower housing had a void that wasn't really being used for anything, so I cut another piece of plywood and I screwed it to the front in order to make it seal better against the front of the enclosure. And it seemed to work out really well. After I started to assemble things, I started to notice a little problem. Some things weren't lining up quite right, but it wasn't because I screwed up the cuts. It was because I designed everything for three quarter inch plywood and the plywood that I was using wasn't actually three quarters of an inch. It was actually a little bit smaller. The difference in thickness compounded the more uh, parts I started to put together. And so in order to maintain an airtight seal, I had to do a little bit of trimming. For the 16 by 20 filters, I chose to go with the premium 9100 from DuPont, which is a MERV 12 filter. And for the pre-filter, I went with the True Blue Basic, which is a Merv 7 filter. I got the pre-filters from Menards for only a couple dollars each, so it should be relatively inexpensive to replace these periodically. Now, one other small issue that I ran into was that I was expecting the filters to be three quarters of an inch thick, since they clearly state on the packaging that the actual size is three quarters of an inch. However, in reality, I found these to be slightly thicker than three quarters of an inch, so I had to resort to plan B and make little plywood clips to hold the filters in place instead of plywood trim board that I was originally planning to use. You'll see what I mean here shortly. After I had everything all trimmed up, I screwed in the slats to hold the filters in place while checking the fit periodically as I went. It helped to use clamps to keep things aligned as I screwed the slats in place. Next, I used a thin strip of plywood against the pulley so that I could mark the edges of the cutout where the belt would feed through the top of the enclosure. Then I drilled a hole in the center and used my jigsaw to make a cutout for the belt. I started small and kept making the cutout a little bigger each time until I knew that the belt had enough clearance so that it wasn't going to be rubbing on the enclosure. Now if you're wondering about the hole, later on I'll be covering most of this up with a small piece of plywood and a screw just to help maximize the air draw through the filters instead of through this hole. Once I was satisfied with the motor placement, I screwed the motor mount into the top of the enclosure. Now, I must have really gotten lucky because I didn't even have to adjust the belt tension at all. Once I got the motor mounted, it just happened to be absolutely perfect. I carefully looked things over just to make sure that the belt wasn't making any contact with the enclosure, and everything looked good. The next step was to get the air diversion box assembled and screwed onto the front of the enclosure. I decided to use 8 inch ducting and found this 8 inch takeoff that has an adhesive peel and stick backing which provides a nice airtight seal. After sticking it in place, I used 3 quarter inch screws to fasten it to the plywood. To cut the 8 inch hole, I used a flush trim bit in my router table. The flush trim bit has a ball bearing that rides along the inside edge of the 8 inch takeoff and this produced a hole that aligned perfectly with the ducting. 
Assembling the inserts went together pretty fast with just some pocket screws. Again, the pocket screws just make it really easy to take apart just in case you don't have things lined up quite right and you need to make slight adjustments. Since I had everything assembled on the bench, I decided to run some tests to see how much the air pressure was affected by adding different filters as well as the plywood inserts that I planned on using with my paint booth. For the first test, I measured the angle of the third louver up from the bottom against my square with no filters in the box. With zero filters, it was registering at about six and a quarter inches. For the next test, I added the True Blue Merv 7 filters, and again, it was registering at about the same six and a quarter inches. Now this was a little surprising because I was expecting to see a little bit of a drop. I wanted to see how the Merv 7 filters compared to the Merv 12 filters, so I removed the Merv 7s and inserted the Merv 12s. This time, there was a very slight drop, but it was barely noticeable since it only dropped about a sixteenth of an inch. For the next test, I wanted to see what happened when I had both the Merv 12s and the Merv 7s installed. This time, it dropped another sixteenth of an inch for a total of about an eighth inch when compared to having no filters installed. For the next test, I sealed one side of the enclosure with a solid piece of plywood then added the one with the eight inch takeoff to the other side. I wanted to see how much airflow I had without going through any filters, so I added a small piece of plywood to cover the filter hole on the back side of the enclosure, since I wasn't going to have a filter in there. This time, I saw the most significant drop yet, which was about three eighths of an inch compared to having an open enclosure with no filters at all. For the next test, I added the MERV 12 filter and then simulated what it would be like if I had the MERV 7 acting as a pre-filter inside of my paint booth by holding the filter up to the 8-inch intake. As you can see, there's a very significant drop in airflow when doing this, which really isn't all that great. These filters aren't optimal for the paint booth setup, so I went back to the store and I picked up some very cheap blue fiberglass filters and I was able to get the airflow back up to where it needed to be for the optimal paint booth setup. Unfortunately, I didn't get those tests on video, so just trust me when I say that those work great. Now that everything's ready to go, the next step is to get it mounted on the ceiling. So first, I used a stud binder and marked all of the studs and ceiling joists with blue painter's tape, then decided on a permanent place to mount it. I picked up some Unistrut from Menards along with some 3 8 inch threaded rod and these little Unistrut inserts which make it really easy to mount to the Unistrut. I cut everything to length, then I screwed the Unistrut to the ceiling joist with some lag screws. After I screwed in the threaded rod, I measured very carefully and tightened them down in their permanent locations. Now that was the easy part. The hard part was to somehow figure out how to get the box up the ladder and then get all four threaded rods inserted into the holes in the top of the box while at the same time getting washers and nuts threaded on and tightened inside the box while holding the box at the same time. Easier said than done with 12 foot ceilings, trust me. My dad stopped over to lend a hand and even with the two of us, it just wasn't going to work. To make it easier, we decided to mount some pulleys on a two by four then mount the 2x4 to the Unistrut using more 3 8 inch inserts that I had, then hoisting the enclosure as close as we could get it before the pulleys touched. I tied off the rope to a cleat that I mounted to my workbench, then we used a floor jack on the ladder to jack it into position. After we had the rods threaded through the holes and fastened, I removed the 2x4 with the pulleys and it was good to go. Now that we had the enclosure mounted on the ceiling, I marked the center of where the 8 inch duct should go and used a long drill bit to drill all the way through the wall and through the siding on the other side. Using the center hole, I used a compass to mark an 8 inch diameter on the siding, 
then use my Dremel tool with the spiral bit to cut through the vinyl siding. I figured that my Dremel would have less of a chance of cracking the siding as opposed to using my jigsaw, but after I got the hole cut out of the siding, I used my jigsaw to finish the job and cut all the way through the plywood. After cutting all the way through, I split the insulation with my hands, pushed it to the side, then inserted the 8 inch duct for a test fit. On the sheetrock side, I used a sheetrock handsaw to cut the hole. The 8 inch duct was just a little long, so we trimmed it down using a tin snips, then put it back together and inserted through the wall. The last step was to secure the external vent to the plywood using screws, then caulk around the top and sides of the vent so that water doesn't creep in. We left the bottom open so that it could drain if water does happen to get in somehow. All right, turn it on. Nice. All right, shut it off. Perfect. For the finishing touches, I added aluminum tape to seal the seams and a black 8-inch stovepipe trim collar. To power the unit, I'm using the same remote switch that I used to operate my dust collector and shop lights. I've been using these remotes for years and I haven't had any problems with them. They're fairly cheap and it's really convenient having all three on the same remote. You basically just take the motor and plug it into one of the included remote outlet receptacles and that's it. I just had to run a short extension cord across the ceiling to the power outlet that my Resner heater is plugged into. After plugging it in, powering it up is as simple as pushing a button. Nice and quiet. From an airflow perspective, I found the placement of the unit on the ceiling to work really well. When the filtered air is thrown out the side of the unit, it follows the outer wall in a circular pattern while drawing the dusty air back in through both sides of the unit. When the fan kicks on in my heater, it actually draws the clean air diagonally across the room, which just helps circulate the air even more. Since installing this, I've noticed a big difference in air quality in the shop. Converting from an air filtration unit to an air extraction unit is quick and easy. Simply pull out the insert for dust mode and insert the one for fume mode and replace your filters accordingly. If you're interested in building this project, I have plans available on my website, which I'll link to in the description of this video. Stay tuned for my next video where I take this project a step further and build a fully collapsible paint booth that sits on top of my rolling workbench and folds up and stores away easily when not in use. If you're interested in more videos like this one, hit that thumbs up button. And subscribe. And subscribe. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.